poor introduction. Everybody here knows him. You've uh, heard him preach before. You've read his articles in the sword. He's been to your churches. He's just been a blessing for these many years as the editor of the great Sword of the Lord newspaper. And I count him a friend, and I'd like to have him come and preach to us from the Word of God. Thank you. Thank you, dear friend. I appreciate so much the privilege that has been mine now for, well, over 20 years. I've forgotten whether it's been 22 or maybe 23 years running that we've done this together, and I've gotten to know a lot of you as well. And Brother Hawkins, you've been hiding this all these years. This is the first time that you've sung and all the, uh, that I've heard you. And uh, you did a good job. I like that. <laughs> good song and well done. And uh, appreciate it very much. And so good to see all of you tonight. Brother, Brother Alcus always does a first class job of getting everything in place. And uh, just uh, is a very hospitable host to all of us. And uh, I appreciate that so very, very much. And my friend and your friend, Brother Rabin, is here, and uh, we're going to have some time before you these next two days, and he has his wife uh, with him this time as well, and so we're glad to have them here, and um, we're just going to have a good time if that's okay. Anybody yes, object to that? Well, it's too bad. We're going to do it anyway. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's get rolling. My text of choice tonight is in the second epistle of Peter, Second Peter and I will, I will do a little bit of a setup here out of the tech, out of the scripture itself before we get to the place where we read. But if you'll find Second Peter, and we'll just do a little bit of hopscotching here to get where we're headed. In this, uh, in this epistle right at the beginning, in chapter 1 and verse 1, there's a phrase, like precious faith. Like precious faith. Now, everything that we are as Christians is predicated upon faith. The very foundation of it, the root of it, is faith. That is, uh, the Lord and uh, the gospel and the Bible and uh, all of the things that relate to that. Uh, we have heard it, we've seen it, we've checked it, we've tested it, and we have signed on to that and we have said, by faith... Uh, he will be my God by faith. The salvation he offers, I will claim. And by faith, the Lord Jesus will be my Savior. That is, we believe it and we trust him by faith. And in this verse, he says, like precious faith. That is, there's more than one of us. And some of us have said, the faith you have is the faith I have. And because we have that a common bond in faith. We have something to cherish. And he calls it precious faith. Like precious faith. And believe you me, it is precious indeed. Without it, we would be lost. Without it, we would be hell bound. Without it, there would be no heaven. Without it, the Christian life would not be possible at all. So like precious faith. If you notice then, drop down to verse number three. And there's another phrase where he says, things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, whenever we put our faith in the Lord, that is the beginning of our Christian life. And that Christian life is different from the life we had before we became a Christian. And there are certain things that pertain to this life and to the godly way. And we will be introduced to those here in this uh, book of the Bible as well as others when he tells us about the things to which we need to pay attention. But he says pointedly there are things, things, making sure that we know there are things to which we should give attention because these will enhance our life and they will make it possible for us to move out of the darkness into the full orb of the light and to live a godly life. So we begin with like precious faith. Then we find out there are things that pertain to life and godliness. You get down to verse number four and there's a phrase where he says, exceeding great and precious promises. Amen. Now, uh, sometimes people promise us things and they do not come through with what they promised. Uh, sometimes they say, I'll pay you on the first of the month. And on the 38th of the month, they still haven't paid. They just didn't do it. They promised, but they didn't do it. 
Or sometimes they'll say, I'll be at a certain place at a certain time, and they do not show. The promise was made, but they do not perform the promise. But now, let me just oh, give you the benefit of a little dab of experience and tell you that I've discovered that what God promises, He will perform to the full. In full measure, you can count on exactly, pointedly, uh, precisely what He says He will do. You can count on it. Take it to the bank. Make the deposit. Write a check anytime you want to on His promises. That's why this says they are exceeding great. And the word precious is again employed there. So with like precious faith, we find out there are things that pertain to life and godliness. And immediately as we begin the pursuit of the Christian life, we're going to discover we're going to need some things on which to hang our hat and hang our coat and hang a lot of other things. And that is where these precious promises come in. On dark days, we have the promises. On days of deficiency, we have the promises. On days when we've been hurt, we have the promises. On days when we don't know what in the world we're going to do with the situation we're in, we have the promises of God exceeding great and precious. Now, if you'll drop down again to verse number five. There's a phrase where he says, add to your faith. Now, folks, whenever you put your faith and trust in the crucified and risen Christ, you are 100% saved. Plus nothing, minus nothing. You are 100% saved. But as you venture into the Christian life, you're going to discover that he's going to say, now, there's going to be some other things that, I, that I'd like to see. And some things I want you to add to who you are. You have become a Christian, so add some things. And here's what he, what he advocates. Virtue. Verse 5, virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity. And he says, I want you to add those things. You know, when people get saved, sometimes uh, some folks, they have a nasty temper or they maybe are just all the time irritable with people and, and horribly impatient. Uh, maybe they have other trashy attitudes or patterns of behavior. Now, if you look at that little list that he said add, you add brotherly kindness, you add charity, you add some of this stuff, it'll clean up the trash. It'll clean it up. And you say, all right, I wanted to get saved, and now then he's telling me there's things that pertain to life and godliness. I've got to get a hold of that, and I've got to add things to my faith. And uh, probably somewhere along the way, we're going to ask why? What's he got in mind? Well, look at uh, verse number eight. He says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful. Now, let's, let's figure this out. Barrenness would suggest childlessness. Barrenness. Unfruitful would suggest Something has been planted, but it hasn't produced. If I plant an apple tree, I expect eventually it to have apples upon it. If I planted, uh, uh, you know, a tomato uh, plant, I would expect uh, sometime in the summer that it would have tomatoes on it. Now, if I planted an apple tree or a peach tree or some other such thing, and the months passed and the years passed, and there was never any signs of apples or oranges or, or peaches or pears or whatever the tree was supposed to produce, I would look at it and I would say, nobody told me that this would just be an exercise in futility. Nobody told me that the tree would not produce, that it would not ever have fruit. And the Lord said, if these things be in you, like precious faith, these things that pertain to life and godliness, and the things that you've added, if these things be in you, he says, then you will not be barren and you will not be unfruitful. Oh, so he is expecting that we will have spiritual children and grandchildren. You know, I, uh, I, I see people just pretty often that I've had the privilege to lead to Christ. And I know there's something, a little bond that will always be between you and people that you lead to Christ. And some of the people that I've led to Christ, 
I, I've trained them or somebody trained them so that they now are leading people to Christ. And every time that, that somebody that I led to Christ calls me up and says, oh, I had to call and tell you, yesterday I led a man and lady to the, to the Lord, or maybe the man and the lady and their three children. I led them. Listen, I look at those and I say, I'm having spiritual grandchildren when that occurs. Amen. Now, this, this is where this heads that you and I, the sons and daughters of God, would be producing and that we would not be barren and unfruitful, that we would not come one day to the judgment seat of Christ and come without having ever produced what the Lord intended that we produce. Now, we, uh, we could touch other things in this chapter. Uh, let me do just one other, Six, verse 16. There's a phrase where he says, we've not followed cunningly devised fables. You, you, you and I, we, I mean, the, we're not building out of Tinker Toys. Uh, this, what we're doing here is not a Lego built house. It's not. What we're dealing with here is not something that somebody set down and just out of their imagination created some yarn. That's not what we got. It's not well-crafted, cunningly devised fables. Everything in the, in the Bible from the first of Genesis to the last of the Revelation, not cunningly devised fables, not fables at all. But what do we have? Well, look at verse 19 and let's read right there. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now in these next three verses, you're going to find that prophecy word three times. Here's the first one. A more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, but uh, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy uh, uh, by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Three times there, verse 19, verse 20, verse 21, the prophecy word occurs. Now, in the Bible, when the word prophecy occurs, sometimes it is predictive. Somebody on a Monday telling you what's going to happen on a Thursday. Got a word from God that, is, that enables them. Some of the Old Testament prophets, they predicted things that came to pass. But most often, most often in the Bible, when this word prophet or prophecy occurs, it's not talking about predictive things, it's talking about proclaiming things, the truth, most of the time. And in that sense, every person called of God to be a preacher is a prophet. And we ought to declare clearly and plainly the truth that God has given to us. This truth comes to us as a sure word, and that sure word is laid out here not, not by the genius of men, but by the inspiration of God. That's clearly said. Now, when you get to chapter 3, he says, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, and both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. This they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be, ye, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now there's more to be read there, but let me stop at that point. Whenever I see in this passage 
the little phrase in verse 19 that tells us we have a more sure word of prophecy. Now I back up and I, I remember we have precious faith. Uh, you and I gather here for this meeting because we have like precious faith. Uh, we have discovered that there are things that pertain to what we ought to be into, life and godliness, the way that we ought to do it. And so we get together to, to talk about those things and to pull some of those things closer. And he says, we've got these great and precious promises and we're to add to our faith and we're not, we're not going to live our life and be barren and unfruitful. And you say, what do I do? What do I do? We have a sure word from God. Right. And in chapter three, here are some of the things that he says. He says, verse number one, uh, he said, I, I, I think you ought to be stirred up. In fact, twice here in this section, he talks about that stirring up, getting stirred up. Now, you know, my birthday rolls around, and the bigger the package, the more excited I become. You know? I mean, I guess maybe I shouldn't get excited about such stuff, but I, Friday night we had a birthday party for one of, my, for one of our granddaughters. She turned 18 years of age. And, uh, you know, we've got other grandkids, a couple of them older than that, some of them younger than that, and we do birthdays, six grandchildren, two children, two little in-laws, and Betty and me, I mean, that's a dozen of us, and we have birthdays all year long. And we celebrate every one of them. Yeah, yeah. We don't, I mean, if I'm out of town and we got to do it early, like we did with Caroline's Friday night, or sometimes we do it a day or two late, but we don't miss them. I mean, we get together, we celebrate. And I mean, you, you'd think we had never done one the way we, I mean, if we get together, we put food together. Sometimes we'll go out to a little restaurant somewhere and eat. Even in a restaurant, I mean, we, we take all the packages in and the balloons, and at the right time, man, we crank our whole group up and we sing, happy birthday, you could hear us for a block away. You say, what is the problem with you people? Well, it's a big deal to us. Family's a big deal. And whenever you and I get hold of what we have here, like precious faith, great and precious promises, and know that God says, I don't want you barren, I don't want you unfruitful. I look at this and then he says, the other verse there, he said, I need to write to you to stir you up once in a while. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, you know, we just need to have some pep rallies. Amen. And so, it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be this conference. It may be Wednesday night when you get back home to your church. Have a pep rally. Stir it up. Too many times, man, we drag. I know we come in Wednesday night. Sometimes we're tired. I know sometimes we have a big full weekend and, you know, we get in there on Sunday. Hey, listen, we need to stir it, stir it, stir it, stir it. I mean, I mean, hell is gathering the masses and heaven is open to all and the Lord has paid the price and he's left me and you with the privilege to do something about that. And we ought to be excited to get to do it. So he says, be stirred. Verse number two, he says, be mindful. Be mindful of the words spoken by the prophets and of the apostles. Oh, you read the epistles. You read them carefully. You get all kinds of instruction, things that'll help you in your personal life and your demeanor and things that'll help you in your ministry and the nurturing of other folks in which you may be engaged. There's so much in there to help us, to show us how to do these things. And he just says, uh, you know, we've, we've got all this stuff. I mean, I mean I'm glad that that uh, the Apostle John and the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul and Dr. Luke and, and others, I'm glad that God chose them and they wrote down these things for us. And just to be excited about what I read in this book. So we're to be mindful and be stirred. Verse three and several of these other verses, he talks about us being watchful. He says, you better be aware, know this, there's going to come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. And you know some of those birds show up at the church house? You're right. yeah. 
I'm talking about the scoffers, the mockers, the, uh, the ungodly. Some of them show up. They walk forward and join the church. Unregenerate, coming in intent on creating havoc. Never happens up here, I guess. But it does in North Carolina. <laughs> it does. And he says, you need to know, you need to know. Be advised, be advised. Guys, listen, we're, we are not working on a picnic ground. We're on a battlefield. So we're to be stirred and be mindful and be watchful and be advised. Uh, verse 10 talks about the coming of the day of the Lord. You and I ought to be alert to that. Yes, Say, when's he coming? I don't know. Could it be today? Yes. Could it be sometime soon? It could be. But it might be a while. I, I don't know when he's coming. And uh, I'm not going to be spooked into setting time frames like some folks do. You know, the, the uh, meteor shower and stuff that's gone on the last couple of nights, stuff like that, and the eclipse coming next Monday. Some of that kind of, it sets some folks off. Now, please, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that it's not something to pay attention to. It is. But, uh, but frankly, I, and, and I'm fascinated with the heavens. I'm fascinated with it. But the big thing I'm looking for is the Savior. And if the stars fall, so be it. I mean, if, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we might even get to a place where Washington, D.C. would have gridlock. But you and I need to keep our eyes peeled toward the heavens, listening for the trumpet, listening for the shout, looking for the Savior. Because when he comes, well, there's going to be some things of significance happen, and we'll obviously be paying attention to that, and we're going to be caught up in that. And so he's, he's telling us, be alert, be alert to that. Verse uh, uh, 11 and verse 14 uh, admonishes us to be holy. Don't, don't let the world ensnare you and trap you. Watch out for the things that might pull you off course. Get you into water where you cannot swim. And then uh, look at verse 15. He says, account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. What's he saying? He's saying being soul conscious. You be aware. What's, what's the Lord up to? He won't see people saved. You know, if I, if I do not have a heart for souls, I'm not thinking like my Savior thinks. And I ought to be, I can be, I should be thinking like he thinks. And uh, being soul conscious. There are people in my path every day of the world. Every day of the world, there are people in my path to whom I can give a witness. I said to the folks last night over in Michigan, I said, all right, all right. But I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing some of, some of us have gotten to the place, I mean, where we don't, we don't even drop tracks in the bathroom anymore. Man, if you're, if, if, if you're scared to death, I mean, I mean, put tracks in the bathroom. I, I've, I've, there's no telling how many hundred tracks I put in bathrooms all over America. In fact, I'm, I'm imagining and I'm, I'm almost convinced that at the judgment seat of Christ there's going to be a long line of folks and I'm going to say, who are they? And they say, oh, we're the crowd that got saved from those tracks you left in the bathrooms. Amen. Now I may be totally off the wall. <coughs> uh, some people say that I am. <laughs> but what I'm saying is let's be soul conscious. Let's be thinking about it. Let, let's get wrapped up in it and determine that sometime, sometime this week, this month, we'll do our best to try to bring somebody to the Savior. Amen. And then one more piece here. Verse 17, he says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know 
these things before. Beware lest you also being led away with the air of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. And when he talks about falling here, he's not talking about losing your salvation. Pointedly says from your steadfastness. So what he's saying is, and, and be steady. Be steady. Don't, don't, don't be on the roller coaster. Don't be up one day and down the next. Just, just get in the track. Oh, but I'm discouraged. Get over it. Get up. Get up. Don't, don't let the devil pull you down into some depth of despair because of this difficulty or that kind of thing. I mean, sure we have to deal with stuff like that. But we must not let the devil steal from us Amen. the joy that there ought to be Amen. in the Christian life and in the ministry. Amen. The ministry. Some of my brethren, men that I know and love, I, I, sometimes I see them and I, I, I hesitate to ask them how they are for fear they'll tell me how bad it is. Now, please don't, don't misunderstand me. You got issues going on at your church? I got, a, I got a big ear to them and I'll listen. But that ought not to define you. The fact that you've got some trouble or somebody giving you grief it ought not to define you. It ought not to keep you from going out and trying to find somebody and bringing them Christ. It ought not, hey, listen, when Sunday morning comes, whatever has been going on inside that should not be going on, when Sunday morning comes, dear preacher friend, get up, open the Bible, pour some gasoline on that thing, set it on fire. Might do a whole heap to help with that problem. I'd, I'd rather keep them guessing. <laughs> what makes that guy tick? Well, it's not, it's not because he is such a big deal. But it's because he's got a great God. Amen. I look at this passage like precious faith. Things that pertain to life and godliness. And on down the list, all the way and saying, hey, you've got a more sure word. You've got a word. So... Be stirred, be mindful, be holy, be, be soul conscious. I'm telling you, you and I got a lot of reason. I, I know men think all oh, things are in a mess, our country's in a mess. But I think we got every reason to get up every morning and march as though we're going to war. And just determine we're not going to be intimidated in this world where we live. But we're going to keep raising the flag to the top of the pole every day that we live and breathe. Amen. God being our helper. Amen. Father, thank you for your love and goodness. Thank you for giving us strength and helping us along the way. And for all of the folks that are here tonight and others that will be here tomorrow. Fill us up once again. Strengthen us so that we may serve you all the more. Bless Brother Raven as he comes to preach in a moment. The other music that will be done the August as he leads and for all that will happen here tonight. Give us, I pray, your choice blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we want to thank you, Brother Smith, for that good challenge and uh, good reminder. And I know that sometimes you feel like quitting, you feel like leaving. I've, been, I've asked the Lord for a transfer. Oh, I don't know how many times. I've been here at this church for 35 years now. And there's been every so often I've said, Lord, don't you have a, a transfer? Don't you have another office you could transfer me to? And he just has never done it. I always pick one like Hawaii, yeah, yeah. Uh, Florida, you know. But I found out there are guys down there that are asking for transfers too. <laughs> but you know what? We live in exciting times. They're perilous times, but they're exciting. No other generation has ever seen what we see. And no other generation has been able to put the things we find in the book of Revelation together. That's right. Like our generation. Right. Other generations scratched their head yeah. and said, how could that happen? How could that happen? We're watching it happen. Yeah, right. That's, That's right. exciting, isn't it? Yeah, right. And so listen, let's just do what Dr. Smith preached and be steady and stay with the stuff and stick with it and just be happy about it. I'm just glad God lets me have a ministry. Amen. Amen. If you get too cranky about your ministry, grumble about it. He might just give it to somebody else, and then you'll be saying, well, I wish I had that ministry back. Amen? All right, you guys are important. Hang in there and uh, stay with the stuff. We're going to have a... We're